there's some people that say, well, I'm looking for a perfect church, then you'll never find it. Because if you joined it, if you found the perfect church and you joined it, it would be imperfect. You'll never find a perfect church. I've traveled all over the world and I've seen hundreds of different types of churches and I've never seen a perfect one yet. And this side of glory, there never will be. Jesus had a little band of men with him, 12 of them. It was imperfect. Judas betrayed him. Peter denied him. When the chips were down at the cross, the rest of them forsook him. There is no such thing as a perfect body on earth. Get into the church and get to work for Christ. All right. Good morning, everyone. I'm Steve Dankos. I'm the executive pastor here at The Well. If you're joining us online, we would love to connect with you. You can fill out the uh, digital connect card and let us know how we can be praying for you. So two weeks ago, I decided I'm going to change up my routine, my morning routine. I'm kind of an early riser, but only because Meredith makes me get up early and, and pitch in because I, I just love to sleep. But I thought, well, I'm going to be, I'm going to try to be a better everything, you know, more high capacity leader, more better husband, more better father, more better. I know that's not good grammar, but this is what I'll do. I'm going to get up even earlier. I'm going to get up just a half hour earlier every day. I know I'm pushing it as it is, but I'm just going to go ahead and set my alarm half hour earlier. Two weeks ago, I tried this. So Monday, I try it. I get up half hour early. It was hard, but I did it. Seriously, I was so tired all day. I could not think straight. I couldn't get more done, but I thought, that's just... That's just day one. I'll try day two. Day two, same thing. I was up early, and I just, my brain was foggy. I was so inefficient. And so I thought, well, it takes 21 days to form a habit. Let's try for day three. Day three, I just couldn't, I couldn't even get out of bed, honestly. Like, and so I was like, I give up. I'm just going back to the way it was. I thought, well, if I could just have the right routine, the right rhythm, then I'll be more productive and maybe the rhythm I have isn't the right one, and I want to have the right rhythm, the right routine. But the right routine can be an idol that defeats the purpose, as I found out. Though maybe I should have given it longer, I don't know. I'm just not going to, though. I love sleep too much. But the right routine, when it's applied to our relationship with God, that's called religion. And that's what we're going to talk about today, religion. And it'd be good to know how I define it. I'm not talking about the broader concept of spirituality or faith. When I talk about religion, I'm talking about a much more constrained version. Now, historical religion, I define like this. The right people using the right elements, usually blood, arranged in the right way, in the right place, at the right times, using the right words in order to manipulate cosmic powers in your favor. That is historical religion. That's what all historical religions generally, generally have in common. Um, but we're, we're enlightened people here, so you know it's the modern world. So modern religion is a little different now, and this is how I define modern religion. The outward structures, symbols, buildings, prayers, routines, and practices that mediate our relationship with God. And I don't think religion is a bad thing. Um, I think all of us have a little bit of religion, whether we think of ourselves as religious or not. But what I'm going to communicate with you today is that sometimes God hates religion. The Pharisees asked Jesus, why do you love hanging out with sinners and why don't you follow the rules? And in Matthew 9, 13, he responds to them with this. Go and find out what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. Jesus is quoting Hosea there, Hosea 6.6, uh, 6, and this is what it says there. For I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and acknowledgement of God rather than burnt offerings. See, these were sacrifices that God himself had set up in the Old Covenant. Um, but in the Old Covenant itself, God goes further. In Amos chapter 5, he says this to the Israelites. I hate, I despise your religious festivals. Your assemblies are a stench to me. But let justice roll on like a river, righteousness like a never failing stream. So you have to wonder, why did God hate their sacrifices? Why did God hate their 
festivities. Were they doing it the wrong way? Well, actually, they were doing it exactly how God had told them to do it. But what we learn in Scripture itself is that religion is supposed to serve a higher purpose. And when it becomes the purpose itself, God hates it. It harms people. It can become an idol, and it can become a weapon fashioned to hurt people. Bruxy Cavey says this in his book, uh, The End of Religion, which I highly recommend. God hates religion, even if it is a structure, a practice, or an institution that God himself has instituted. Once the structure stops serving the relationships, the relationship, and starts substituting for relationship, it has become the enemy of God. Religion is not always bad. It's just not the point. Structure is not bad. Uh, we can't help but have a structure, a rhythm to our lives, to our faith, to everything we do. Um, and it's not that liturgy is bad, you know, like high church or formal, formal worship. That's not what I'm talking about either. I think we have a well-defined liturgy here at the well. It goes something like this. It starts with coffee for most of us, if you're like me. And then we have an opening praise song and then a reflective song and then usually communion, but today we're doing it at the end. A response song, some announcements, a teaching, which usually is something like a story, a scripture, explanation, then an example, an application, an exhortation, and then some prayer and then a sending song. So everybody has religion. Everybody has a little bit of liturgy as well. And think of it like water versus a cup. See, structure or religion is the cup but the point is to drink the water. It's not really about the cup, but if you wanna drink water, a cup can be helpful. The cup is any structure that facilitates relationship with God, but the point, the water, is relationship with God. It's not unlike having structure in any relationship. The point of my marriage to Meredith is to have a loving relationship between the two of us, and we found that structure is helpful, and uh, when we don't have structure, things go off the rails. So we have schedules, we have special times where we go on dates, where we communicate, invest in each other, or even dates where we talk about the structure of our relationship. Um, every, every relationship benefits from some structure. Um, my best friend, Nate, I call him whenever I'm on my way to Costco. That's when we talk. That's just, that's our schedule. But when the structure gets in the way of relationship, we should change it. When the cup gets in the way of drinking water, we should exchange it. When religion gets in the way of relationship, we should reform it. But religious people confuse the container for the contents. So the message today, let's not confuse the container for the contents. What is more important, the cup or the water? Of course, it's the water. The building or the people, the ritual or the relationship. You see, as religious people, we can't help but often confuse the cup for living water. We become oblivious when the cup is dry, and so when we're thirsty, we lick the cup to quench our thirst, and I'll spare you the visual example of that. But, yeah. <laughs> and all this starts to happen in the fourth and fifth century church and gets worse over the next thousand years. We're in week five of Loving Church, in week three, Meredith told us how, after the conversion of Constantine, which is amazing and really beneficial in so many ways, it also was detrimental to the church, and it introduced paganism, politics, and power into the church. And it wasn't too many generations after that, that in week four, last week, Meredith was talking about how the church leadership, at least, was corrupted by greed, immorality, and status-seeking. And today we're going to look at how one movement, powered by the love, excuse me, powered by the erection of Jesus, became two religions, and today we know them as the Roman Catholic and Eastern Orthodox churches. Seventy years after Constantine, Emperor Theodosius became the emperor. The year was uh, 381, and he was the first emperor to require everyone become a Christian. He banned paganism and started persecuting them. And during his reign was also the time when bishops, the leaders of the church, instead of coming up from 
the ranks of the church themselves and going through discipleship to Jesus and into the church. Bishops of the church now, they just start to drop down from positions of political power, like Roman senators, um, just powerful politicians. They would literally just, the emperor would just, all right, now you're the bishop of this region, you're the bishop of that region. In some cases, they weren't even Christians until the day they became the bishop. You can imagine that this um, wasn't good for the church, and last week Meredith talked about the monastic reaction to all that, and people just, in order to feel like they, to follow Jesus, they needed to leave the church altogether and start their own communities. But Emperor Theodosius in 381 called the Council of Constantinople. Some people, and if you read history, uh, it's called the Second Ecumenical Council. Constantine had the first ecumenical council with the Council of Nicaea that Meredith talked about a few weeks ago. And in my opinion, that was the only ecumenical council because every council that the church called after that always left someone out, and it was always overtly political. You see, Theodosius only invited the bishops of the eastern half of the empire, the Greek half. And the council affirmed Nicaea and did some theological things, but the main reason why he called it was because Constantinople was the new capital. They called it New Rome. And the bishop of Rome, because it was the old capital and the biggest city, just naturally had a lot of sway, had more sway than all the other bishops. And the Eastern bishops didn't like that. So they had, they didn't invite any of the Western bishops and they invited all the Eastern bishops and they declared, okay, now the Bishop of Constantinople now has preeminence over the Bishop of Rome. Of course, the Roman Bishop didn't like that. And he wrote back, and this is the first example of this historical argument. Um, he said, well, actually the Bishop of Rome has preeminence and he should be in charge of the entire church and in charge of all the other bishops because it's not about what city you're from or what the capital is. The Bishop of Rome were claiming apostolic succession directly from Peter and Jesus said to Peter on this rock, I'll build my church. So that's, and the Catholic uh, church still makes that argument today, but this is when it was first used, at least that we know of. They were political power plays. Um, but it was a sign that the East and West, which were culturally different and growing apart politically, and now that the church was political, the East and Western churches started to grow apart. They couldn't help but follow. I have a map of the Eastern and Western Roman Empire at the time of Theodosius, and um, for Meredith's sake, the red and the purple are, is land, and the white stuff is water in between. She has a good geography story to tell you about yeah, you're welcome. See, I'm getting my revenge on you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, what, that's what we use the pulpit for, sadly. Yeah. 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 So you have the Greek-speaking east, which is on your right, the Latin-speaking west on your left. And they had some natural cultural distinctions as well. Um, of course, the language of the west was Latin, and the language of the east was Greek. Uh, the outlook of the West being the uh, legal capital for so long was very legal, and the East, they were very philosophical. And that starts to play out in the ph different philosophy, uh, theologies of the two churches. And then, of course, different capitals, Rome for the West and Constantinople in the East. Now it's in Istanbul, Turkey. It wasn't soon after the Council of Constantinople that the entire Western Empire completely collapsed to Germanic tribes. And with that, the East and the West lost touch with each other. Um, they grew more apart over hundreds of years. And uh, they started to develop some religious distinctions and differences as well. So the growing religious differences that grew over centuries were they had different languages, of course. They started to practice communion differently. One church only used unleavened bread. The other church only used leavened bread. Slight differences in a word or two here or there in their creeds, different liturgies, which is their service order. They started to dress differently, uh, use different architectural buildings, different symbols, different shaped crosses. Their holidays for things like Easter were different, uh, different rules, different leaders, and of course, a different holy city. And of course, the fact that they thought of their political capitals as their holy city should set off some alarm bells in your head. And all this happened very slowly over hundreds of years, like Meredith says every week. We're painting with a really broad brush because we don't want to do a 2,000-week series, one year of church history, 
every week. So, all right, so over time, a people united by the living water that Jesus offers starts to become two people separated by politics and religion. Can you imagine if that happened today? If two people that were one, politics and religion, starts to separate them. It's all too easy to imagine. Both churches, both groups of people, they're becoming two religions in that they're starting to think of, well, you need the right people to say the right words at the right time in the right buildings. Uh, they both thought of Sunday morning. They started to think of communion as a sacrifice every week, that literally Jesus was re-sacrificed every week in order to forgive their sins. And over time, their leaders on both sides began to think of their religion as the point in and of itself. They had begun to confuse the cup for the water. And each group of leaders were increasingly demanding loyalty, not to Jesus, but to them and their religion. And there were plenty of Jesus followers and Christians during this time. They just weren't the people running those churches for political reasons. We're fortunate that Jesus had something to say about this in the New Testament. The picture of the East and the West looks very similar to a political dispute during Jesus's time. And we find that in the story of the woman at the well in John chapter four. A year ago, Meredith preached an amazing sermon on this that focuses on the woman at the well herself. And I highly recommend you check that out. But we're not gonna really spend time with her today. We're gonna talk about the dispute between the Samaritans and the Jews. In the uh, Gospel of John, it says that Jesus was uh, on his way to Galilee from uh, Judea, and he has to pass through Samaria. He doesn't have to. He just doesn't want to do what most Jews do and take the long way around. So he purposefully goes through Samaria. And the Samaritans were a different religion than the Jews, but they had used to all be the same religion. But after 700 years before, the Assyrians conquered the northern tribes of Israel, deported half of them, brought in another half of the population from different parts of Mesopotamia. And now you had this half-breed group um, called Samaritans, and they worshiped in different buildings. They had a different holy mountain, different rules. They spoke Aramaic instead of Jewish in their services. It was a different group of the right practices. And so Jesus passes through Samaria. He st stops at a Samaritan town. The disciples go in to buy food and Jesus waits at the well. While he's waiting at the well, a woman comes to draw water at noon and she um, goes to draw water and then Jesus starts talking to her. And of course she's shocked because she's like, hold on, you, one, you're a Jew, two, you're a man, you're not allowed to talk to me, but you are talking to me. So they go ahead and have an amazing conversation and uh, Jesus talks to her about her life. And eventually she says, she starts to trust him a little, and she starts to ask him about religion. And this is what she says in John chapter 4, verses 19 through 24. Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you Jews claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. Woman, Jesus replied, believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit, and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. So the woman is asking Jesus basically, what's the right religion? What are the right externals? Who's right? Who's wrong? us Jews and us Samaritans, we can't agree. Should we worship on this mountain or in Jerusalem? And Jesus says, well, true worship is neither here nor there. And the word for worship is interesting. It's Greek is proskynine, and it literally means to fall down prostrate before. And J. Michael Ramsey in his biblical commentary on the subject says this, Jesus's answer reminds the Samaritan woman that worship in the literal sense of falling down and prostrating oneself is a metaphor for the state of your heart. In the prophetic tradition of rend your hearts and not your garments in Joel 2.13, he is saying that the true worshipers are known not by their bodily posture, nor by their means of worship, 
nor by their place of worship, but by the Son and Spirit's loving presence in and among them. Most theologians think that spirit and truth are references to the Holy Spirit and Jesus himself, who says that he is the truth. And that's certainly true, but more basically, and we don't want to miss the more surface level point, is that Jesus is saying that to worship in spirit and truth is to have the right heart instead of the right external religion. True worship is not about the right rituals. And I don't want us to be confused. Some people interpret this verse to think, oh, true worship is about inward private worship as opposed to outward. No, it's about the heart, and it could be inward or outward. It's not about individual versus communal. It's about both. And it's not about Jesus recommending informal worship as opposed to formal worship. Jesus is saying it's about the heart, whether it's formal or informal. So true worship is not a state of appearances which is always influenced by the culture of our time, but a state of the heart. Worship that God desires is a heart that is aligned with the Trinity, the God who is loving relationship. See, that is what the Trinity is when the Bible says God is love. Only a multi-personal God can be love because love requires persons to give it and receive it. A single person God can be loving or have love, but cannot be love. Love also requires structure, a container, and we see that the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit take on roles even with each other and with us. But it's not about the structure, it's not about the container, it's about loving each other. The religions of the Jews and the Samaritans were about container management for both of them. It didn't work to transform hearts. They had confused the cup with the contents, and their religion was about using the right cup. And Jesus offers us living water. You can get it anywhere, you can get it anytime. And you might need a cup, but it's not about the cup. So back to the east-west split, we're gonna finally separate, go through history and separate these, these guys out. So between the fifth and the 11th centuries, the churches continued to grow apart with limited communication, growing differences, growing misunderstandings. And sometimes you'd have a good leader here or there for each church that would patch things up. But for every good leader you have, you have a bad leader that would just make things worse. A few times compromise for unity was offered, but it was only if one church would forever submit to the other one. Like, all right, we'll do things your way or a little bit your way as long as you forever become a part of us and do what we say. And of course, no one ever agreed to do that. And the church was run by politicians. And you had two very different political and cultural worlds. They started to think of themselves as two different churches, the Eastern Orthodox and the Roman Catholic. And for both churches, Jesus and then the scripture itself had begun to recede from the center of their faith and replaced with tradition. A mix of Christian and pagan ideas dominated by politics and culture. They had become two religions. And sometimes, God hates religion. It can be an idol. The final split came in the 11th century. In 1043, the Byzantine emperor named the ambitious politician Michael Cerularius as the new patriarch of Constantinople. So the patriarch of Constantinople at the time would be the head of the Eastern Church. In 1052, for political reasons, he ordered all Latin-speaking churches in the East, and there were still many in the big cities, because they used to be part of one Roman Empire, remember? He ordered them all to either use Greek language in the practices or be shut down, and any that refused were shut down. So the Roman Pope retaliated by forcing any churches in the West that spoke Greek to switch to the Latin language and the Latin practices or be closed down, and that's what happened. And then in 1054, the Pope sent an envoy, Cardinal Humbert, to Constantinople to try to work things out, and when he got there, Cardinal Humbert demanded that the patriarch Cerularius and the Eastern Church submit to Rome. And when he refused, Cardinal Humbert marched into the Hagia Sophia, the Church of Holy Wisdom, in Constantinople, now Istanbul, and placed a bull of excommunication for Cerularius and his entire church on the altar, and then he left. And then Cerularius retaliated by excommunicating the Pope and his church. 
and then they were officially two churches. And all that could have been worked out if not for the Fourth Crusade. Sadly, they could have gotten back together, but for political reasons, the uh, Crusaders ended up, uh, instead of uh, attacking Muslim forces, they saw Constantinople as weak and they attacked the city directly and sacked it. And for three days, they, starting on Good Friday into Holy Saturday and then Easter Sunday, the Crusaders, wearing red crosses on their shoulders, killed every Eastern Christian they could find and stole everything of value that they could. And the politics behind that uh, were many, and I've got them all written down for you, but the point is all the same. It was terrible, and it was done in the name of Christ. Sometimes God hates religion. Religions are like cups, and we can use them to drink water, but for some reason, we like to use them to hit each other over the head with. Modern religious expressions and styles aren't necessarily right or wrong, but they're just cups. Whether you like high church with liturgy, stained glass windows in a nice cathedral and incense, or low church like we have here, lower church, whether you like old fashioned hymns or contemporary praise music, Cups aren't right or wrong. Maybe they work well, maybe they used to work well but don't anymore. Maybe what works for you doesn't work for someone else. Maybe a church gets taken over by politics and needs to be reformed to get back to Jesus as Lord. It's about worshiping in spirit and in truth, the heart of the matter, not confusing the cup with the water, not confusing religion with God or religion with faith in God, not confusing politics with faith in God. Bruxy Cavey says this, the unholy alliance of religion and politics always wreaks havoc by building on society the myth of all myths, that the universe is run by coercive power rather than on humble love. Religion and politics both are necessary, we'll always have them this side of heaven, but they are only good in as much as they bring about God's love in the world. Historians study history to learn from it so that we don't repeat our mistakes or our low points. And it's the same with church history, and that's part of why we're doing this church series. So as a church, we can learn from the mistakes of the church's past. And we've made all the mistakes already and all the ones we see the church making now that we've made before. And what we can learn from it is that we can be a loving church if and when we focus on Jesus above all else. That's what it means to call Jesus Lord. And those of you who struggle with church can get back to loving the church when the church focuses on Jesus above all else. Jesus did not come just to be a sacrifice. He came to end all sacrifices with himself. Jesus did not come to start a religion. He came to replace all religion with himself. Jesus did not come to reform Judaism or to start Christianity. We need to think way bigger than that, church. He came so that God would become human, yet still be God, show us the way, defeat sin and death, and forever join our humanity to God, which is what we call eternal life. Christian religion is just a cup. Jesus op offers us living water. Here at the well, we're not going to be caught up with which cup is best. We're gonna be caught up with Jesus being the source of living water. What we care about here at the well isn't what cup you prefer. What we care about is that everybody drinks the living water that Jesus gives us. And if that's the kind of spirituality that you're looking for, then I invite you to join us here at the well. We need you here. Your gifts and experiences are necessary for us to be a more loving church. And more importantly, we want you here. God loves you more than you can possibly imagine. Regardless of who you are, what any one person or church has told you. And here at the world, we aren't better than anyone else, 
but we are committed to keeping Jesus at the center of everything that we do. Don't let a bad cup cause you to go without water. Don't let a bad church experience stop you from pursuing Jesus. God became human so that you could know God's love. God and Jesus has chosen to forever remain human so that we can forever have life with God. Jesus gives us the Holy Spirit, the living water, freely to anyone who asks. Don't hold back. The water is fine. Jump in and drink. Let's pray. Gracious God, may we be a church that loves you, learns from our mistakes, and puts Jesus at the center of everything. And the Holy Spirit, would you empower us to do just that? Would you help us to be light in our families, to love our community? And would we glorify you through all that? And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.